You're listening to the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, Episode 13. Ever since she was a child, Stephanie has felt a strong connection with nature. She embraces the importance of living as part of the natural world rather than separate from it. And she knows that sharing that connectivity is critical to protecting nature on a global scale. Driven by her kinship to the wild world, Stephanie focused on her path, took risks and traveled the world. She's worked with and learned from biologists, conservation leaders, CEOs, farmers and fishermen in Africa, Australia, Japan, Thailand, Malaysia, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea and the United States. The more she experienced, the clearer it became how everyone and everything are connected in a complex, interconnected web of life. As a wildlife conservation professional, she's committed to raising awareness about the disconnect between modern society and the natural world. And she's determined to explore and share how each of us can use our specific talents and skills to bridge the gap and make our planet a healthier place for generations to come. Stephanie is uniquely prepared to reach that important goal with a resume that reads like no other. She's worked in the leading U.S. zoological parks, such as the San Diego Zoological Society, SeaWorld, the Honolulu Zoo Society, and Omaha's Henry Dawley Zoo and Aquarium. She's immersed herself in dive scouting for whale sharks on the Australian Ningaloo Reef, seeing firsthand what threatens our magical underwater world. And she's had hands-on impact raising money for Africa's Kampawana Foundation and the construction of the first children's library in Kenya. Today, she's not only the host of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, but also a public speaker on the global efforts of conservation and sustainability. Her insight has earned her a seat on the International Union of Conservation Nature's Education and Communication Commission. In 2015, she was named one of the latest recipients of the Ambassador for the Planet Award, given by the renowned environmental artist and conservationist Wyland. That honour places her in a very select group that includes renowned naturalist Jane Goodall, iconic oceanographer Jacques Cousteau, former Vice President Al Gore, marine biologist Dr Sylvia Earle, actor Robert Redford and professional surfer Kelly Slater. Recently, Stephanie became a deep elite ambassador for Scuba Pro, was the subject of an article in Dive Alert magazine, joined the advisory council for Ecology Project International and became co-founder of the Creative Animal Foundation non-profit. Stephanie has also been interviewed on the Harry Connick Jr.'s daytime show Harry, as well as Animal Planet's Animal Nation with comedian Anthony Anderson. She's also featured on an episode of DIY Network's Tiny House, Big Living. Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time out to be on the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast. We've got this beautiful backdrop of the Tetons behind us, Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival. Could it get any better than that? What a stunning place to be. This is a really magical place. It's my first time coming here, and I am blown away. I was actually late for a meeting last night because I was on a panel this morning and with myself and Bob Poole and Chris Morgan. And I was two hours late because I took a wrong turn and ventured to a different place it, but it was great because for the next hour I got to really drive around no joke around all of Jackson Hole to get up to this location and to see the the sun setting on the mountains and moose crossing bison pronghorn it was just magical there, there are worse places to get lost than Yellowstone National <laughs> Park that, can, that that's for sure so um, Stephanie that this podcast is all about inspiring filmmakers and um, people who just want to get into the industry to uh, to you know follow their dreams of, of how they can break into the industry uh, whether they're directors producers on-air hosts uh, camera people it's really to give um, an inside look at the people who are working in the industry and see how they got in and and what they're doing. So can we get a little bit of background? How did you break into the industry? Oh, um, you know, I, I went to Africa when I was a senior in college and did a research project, and that was huge for me. I really hadn't traveled a lot growing up. Um, my family, I'm kind of the black sheep. They want to stay, and they're a little bit... Uh, hesitant to get leave <laughs> even like Iowa or the Midwest let alone go to Africa 
So for me, that was huge because I got to see this whole other world that it was very adventurous and exciting and different. And it, I learned more about myself and my own culture. And I started having conversations with villagers and kids and poachers and poach uh, rangers that used to be poachers that use their skills now to be rangers. And it was I just started having these stories or listening to these stories and I became so addicted to, to wanting to share that with other people. I'm like, what? My friends don't know this. If they knew, then maybe they would... Uh, vote differently maybe they would put their money or their uh, or their sharing on social media maybe they would do all that differently if they just knew these stories knew what it was like to be in your shoes and I remember I was sitting in the middle of all of these kids like 40 kids I have this picture I, it looks like a bullseye because I'm white as white can be surrounded by like 50 African children and we're singing and dancing and they did my hair and my makeup and they really brought me into their their culture into their family really and we had the best conversation, even though we didn't speak the same language. And my professor of four years had said to me, I think you know where you're supposed to go. Or, you, you know, you have the language of love. Like, you need to do something great with this. And I was probably, I think I was 23. And when I heard that, I was like, whoa, okay, what is that? It was so mysterious. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> you know, and for my professor, she had helped me through so many things. So that night we had a glass of wine. And I'm like, Sally, what did you mean by that? And you know, it, she didn't want me to ask questions. She wanted me to just take it and go where I wanted to go. And so she, she left it very uh, mysterious for many, many years of my life. But it did plant a huge seed in me that, wow, there were, I met nature guides. I, I saw world travelers. I, I want to do this. This is what I've yearned to do. You know, growing up watching Wild Kingdom reruns and watching Nat Geo and looking at Nat Geo magazines. And I wanted to go out there. I wanted to see those stories. So I think the, t the choices I made um, when I went to the Omaha Zoo and the Honolulu Zoo and the San Diego Zoo and I got a chance to go to Thailand and Australia and New Zealand, Papua New Guinea and Borneo, every single one of those steps were baby steps. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just took a risk and ate ramen noodles or whatever the heck I could afford, which was barely anything. And I tried to make very smart decisions and have you know, practice common sense, because a lot of the times I was traveling alone on my own. I, mean, I was in my 20s for most of this. And you were, just to clarify, you were, you were t making a choice to travel just so you could experience different cultures. Yeah. I, I, it's not like I said, one day I'm going to be working in film and I'm going to be the host of Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I never said that to myself. It was more so I wanted to have experiences that others hadn't. I wanted to find the truth. I was so hungry to learn the truth about human behavior, my background's behaviorism, and I wanted to know how, you know, how we evolve to make the decisions that we do um, when we cut down trees and make our homes or when we start agriculture, when we're fishing, how we treat each other um, and how everything's all connected. I was just very thirsty to know the truth behind all of that. I think it probably all stems back to the same thing most people are intrigued by and that's who the hell am I? Why am I here? What is, what is this weird life thing that we're all experiencing together? And I just became so addicted to that. And so, yeah, one thing led to the another, and I took a lot of volunteer experiences. Uh, most of them were, you know, what, you know, I did get lucky and score a few really rad diving uh, gigs on the Great Barrier Reef and on the Ninglu Reef tagging whale sharks. But when I got into Borneo in the Philippines, I was doing turtle work and orangutan work, and I just did it for free. And sometimes I would clean toilets in the morning just to help out the researchers in the afternoon, just to get some insight and learn the things that I loved and that I was passionate about, but also learn the things that I didn't like so I could check it off. Because sometimes people think filmmaking and adventuring and working in wildlife biology and conservation is, is this beautiful, magical thing. I don't know what they picture, but it, it, what they don't know is all the hard work that goes into it as well. So I wanted to kind of just clean up that and be like, okay, check, 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 check. I don't, I don't want to do, I don't want to do that dirty work, but I'm okay with this dirty work. So after a couple years of, of traveling nonstop, I landed in Hawaii and I had worked there before at the Honolulu Zoo and I was starting to do a lot of media. I started going on the news every morning and I started filming short things for their YouTube channel and our education website. I had no idea that I would ever be going on camera. Um, but it just kind of happened that way. And then I started getting training on the cameras and the audio and realized that, <laughs> and it was pushed on me by a lot of people, the host isn't everything, you know, you're not a big deal. You know, it was pretty, it was nice. It was, it was a chance to really learn that everybody had a role and it's not just about the host, it's about everybody. Um, 
and I just be- I just fell in love with it very quickly. And I wanted to start our own program uh, in Hawaii that would combine all these organizations that are all so passionate about the Hawaiian ecosystem, yet they were all not working very well together because they were all fighting for the same money, the same grants, and that's survivalism, right? So a lot of organizations will go to the extremes in order to s- try to stand out so that they can get those funds. And I was like, what if we, we got to do something. What if we all applied for the same grants and then we put it in a big bucket and then we dis- dispersed it evenly so everybody got enough food to survive and live? And then we could collaborate with our knowledge to make something bigger. And then I'm, my niche is I'm going to help, help create this, sh- this show to show off how we're all working together to protect this ecosystem. The Hawaiian ecosystems are so, there's so many endemic species and they're becoming extinct so quickly for many different reasons. And I wanted to show how we, we could as humans, even though we were different cultures and different backgrounds and I want to focus just on monk seals and this person wants to focus just on phytoplankton, but let, how is that all connected? So I started writing a show, even though I had no idea what the hell I was doing, but I just went for it and I just started asking questions and networking and finally met the right people to help create the show. And then right when we were about to pitch the pilot to get funding, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom held a contest to look for a new host. And it was just one online webisode and we won like $15,000, which is an insane amount of money to an adventurer who was living out of a backpack for 10 years. <laughs> ramen noodles. <laughs> and eating You can buy a lot of noodles for that. <laughs> oh my gosh, dude, that's what I, I just saw. No dollar signs. I just saw a cup of noodles. <laughs> and um, so as scary and intimidating as it was, the criteria and, and to see all the steps over the course of like four months was the process of putting up your audition tape online and then having people vote for your video and then it going down from like 1600 down to us top three where we were doing an incredible amount of screen testings and auditions and interviews and stuff like that until I eventually won. And that was in July of 2013. I mean, that's, it's fantastic that you, um, that you really, you knew you wanted to work, um, in some kind of capacity with adventure and wildlife, but you didn't know exactly what that was. And I think so many people are in that position. Mm -hmm. Lots of the people I've met here are in that position. They come for advice and they, they know they, you know, they, they, they want to break into the industry, but they're not really sure. And I love the fact that you took it on yourself to go out and have the adventures. Because my advice to people is if you, if you want something bad enough, then make it happen. Don't expect someone else to come and do it for oh, you. Oh, that is so true. And, and that's what you did. You went out and you did that. And then although what you're doing now is kind of a culmination of all that, it wasn't the thing you were seeking, but it's still an end game to what you were looking for. Well, I think, you know, somewhere along the way, uh, I think it was when I was film or tagging whale sharks in the Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia, I had an Animal Planet producer come out, and I think he produced pit bulls and parolees or something like that but I took he and his girlfriend out swimming with these whale sharks and I taught him about our tagging process and how the different spot patterns on the whales we can take a picture of it and we use like NASA technology to create constellations within their spotting to identify these animals and then we jumped out of the water and we're like oh my gosh we got to go back in there's four mantas or a humpback whale that somebody said I mean obviously we don't jump in because that's not legal but <laughs> you know, know we, you we whatever it may be um, we get so excited about it and they come back out of the water they're like oh this is cool and we talk about it and at one point after you know in the day it was like eight hours in the day he's like you should have your own tv show and that was a huge seed planter for me because I, I grew up you know, with Wild Kingdom and Jeff Corwin and Steve Irwin and the Kratz. And I, I remember dreaming of becoming a host. I, I, I never set out to do that, but that was definitely there. And I think that it was like a seed that was planted in my mind. Um, and if you believe in manifesting, maybe that was me manifesting that because then eventually it did happen. It was like you know, you should host a TV show. And I'm like, oh, wow, I used to dream of that all the time when I was a kid. But no, I couldn't do that. I don't want to be on camera. I do live. I like taking you out in the action. Let's go tag whale sharks or, you know, I want to take you through the Serengeti. And I like to do live shows and do a lot of presenting that way. But no, not on camera. I'm going to suck on camera. And he's like, okay, fine. I'm like, no, wait, no, wait, wait. (laughs) Talk to me more. (laughs) No, I was just trying to play hard to get. Can't you just give me the, just try to give me the show. And he was so sweetie, that's not how it happens anymore. Unfortunately, it was like, uh, what was it, 2010 or 11? And he goes, you know, you're going to have to, there's a lot of competition. You're going to have to put in the effort 
to figure out who you are and what your story is going to be in your voice. You might not even be very good on camera, so you need to learn about hosting and uh, storytelling and get some camera guys and film a pilot, but that's going to be about 22 grand. I'm like, that that's an insane a lot of money for a conservationist basically working for free <laughs> and for noodles <laughs> um, and probably bagged wine at that time. <laughs> Goon. Right, right. Which you can uh, also use as a camping pillow afterwards. Yes, right? isn't that lovely? Oh, yes. So he was like, no, I just think that this is a path that you need to consider. And that was a huge planter for me. So probably t- it was not... It was probably another two years later before I was really like, wow, maybe I can do something with this. I, I had no idea what I was doing and it was very scary, but I, once again, I just took risks and I asked quite, I asked so many questions. My mom said that my teachers growing up complained all the time that I always asked too many questions. You know what? If I could go back and tell her like, look, me asking all these questions and connecting with all these people and trying to learn about all what all these conservationists do all the way to what a cameraman does to an audio guy to the producer the director is what got me where I am today now I'm paid to ask other people questions to learn about what we can do to make the the planet healthier for all living things so boom (laughs) (laughs) that's right that's fantastic that's great so so you you win this competition you're now the host presenter for Mm -hmm. the mutual of Omaha yeah what's it like what was that feeling like for you you know you grew up on that show that's uh that's that show had been running a long long mm-hmm. time and now here you are the new host of it well, you know how how did that sit with you it's gonna make me cry thinking about it it was the moment I got the call I was by myself in like a storage off it like a storage section of our building in the Honolulu Zoo I mean it was like we had biofacts and bones and bird you know ostrich egg was right next to me I actually almost dropped it um, when I got the call <laughs> and I, f- I remember her telling me I mean looking around with my hand on my head just like oh my gosh I, I, I actually made this happen they're gonna find out that I tricked them or something <laughs> like how did this happen and I hung up the phone and I remember just falling to my knees and just I it was like this immense amount of joy and and fear and excitement and gratitude that I've and it just exploded but no noise came out I just like and I just cry and I just started crying with just the happiest tears and then I stood up and I jumped around and nobody was there and I was like somebody has to be here to be with me to enjoy this but I wasn't legally allowed to tell anybody until they announced it right how long was that it was a few days. Okay. It was a few days. I want to. I want to say it was less than five days. Okay. Somewhere between three and five days. It's a long is, time when you're that excited <laughs> to oh hold on God. to that secret. I got my dream job. I mean, my parents. I can't. Oh man, I remember when they found out. They're like, "How did you keep this from us?" I'm like, "Cause I was so terrified that if I told one person that I wouldn't get the job, I mean, this meant the world to me." So yeah, it was. To this day, I still pinch myself, and every single time somebody finds out that I'm the host. They go back to when they grew up watching this show and how it impacted them. And there's so much joy and love that comes out because it's it's what taught them about traveling or adventure. It took them into another world to show them a culture in, you know, Asia or Africa uh, that they didn't even know existed. And so that increases compassion. And and then you had that this other group of people that saw it for something more. We, We saw it like. I want to be doing this and this work is so incredibly important and I want to be one of those puzzle pieces. And so this show changed the lives of so many people and it's incredible that I, every time I say that word, all of those memories and all those feelings and those nostalgic uh, memories of finishing dinner and going to lay on the floor and getting that ice cream because I finished all my dinner and, and getting to eat my ice cream while watching Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler go on these crazy adventures and everybody has their stories um, but they're all but they're all very similar it's Sunday night with what's that guy yeah Marlon Perkins and there was the other guy that was always jumping out of the helicopter onto a moose or something to tag it oh that's Jim Fowler oh gosh every you know it, it's just I, it never gets old it's so addicting uh, the, I mean, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear you, the passion you have and obviously the emotion that you, that you have for, for landing that role. Now, tell us a little bit about, um, well, well, firstly, 
the, the, it's kind of changed, right? The hosting has changed from what it was originally. You've kind of brought a modern twist to it. And um, I, I remember when you were doing the panel earlier on, you were talking about how I think you did a handstand in, in the audition, right? And, and when you got it, they told you, you're, you're crazy enough for us. This is exactly what we want. So you bought a new um, kind of breath of fresh air to it. Tell us a little bit about that. Now, after doing this for almost five years, um, the team likes to remind me that it's my multiple personalities and how I can shift between all of them. They're all very genuinely me, but how it's so convenient that from the beginning, there's these, you know, there's this spontaneous girl that does a back handspring off the boat right before doing coral research into a, a huge group of jellyfish and I get stung like crazy and then I have to come up and get vinegar all over me while I'm trying to memorize my lines before I do it. You know, I do handstands on, on tables. Um, I like to joke and sometimes I'm, I'm quite anthropomorphic and I'm sure I get criticism for that, but I don't care because I know people and I know people connect, um, much better to other animals that don't speak can't always show facial expression um and they they use their senses very differently you know they use hormones a lot of the time they're very uh, in tune with their their sense of smell and such and humans were very visual and, and hearing and so there's this this language bro block that there's no Rosetta Stone for and I feel like I'm getting better and better at understanding not just sitting with these kids in Africa and we don't have a language I still understand them and I feel the same when I'm around sharks or snakes even though they don't make a facial expression like an orangutan or a puppy or whatever so I'm very passionate about having fun with it and sometimes being anthropomorphic and um you know, I don't jump out of helicopters onto things and I don't stare at, at, a, at a camera and always just straight up deliver lines. I, I like to bring people with me. I like to give analogies and metaphors. I want people to feel what I'm feeling. I want people to imagine not just being in the shoes of their neighbor, but being in the shoes of this, this shark. Um, I'm very passionate about misunderstood animals, as you can tell. I, I'm so frustrated that for however many years that we've done movies on sharks and snakes and wolves and they're, they're always the bad guy and I understand that sells but unfortunately for me I've been able to see the negative consequence from that if we put fear and the disconnect of like this language barrier between these species and why we're important and we, we lose compassion then you don't care if the snake is killed you don't care about shark finning you don't care if there's a wolf hunt because good the only good wolf the only good snake the only good shark is a dead one and I'm so sick of that phrase. And I think that if we could bring these animals into people's homes and let them see them in a way that, like, look at this family, this pack of wolves is a family just like you're a family and you're trying to survive just like they're trying to survive. And it's hard now because there's 7 billion of us that they're trying to compete for resources with. You need to remember that you're an animal too. You're part of the ecosystem, you're part of the food web and the choices that you make in order to get your air, your water, your sun, and your habitats are going to impact them. But also, if you don't care about that, you need to remember you're an animal and it's going to impact you too. But for me, it's being anthropomorphic and using metaphors and analogies and trying to capture those things in the moment that matter to me. And I know that that's a little bit different than it used to be in the past. Plus I have to do it in different platforms. You know, I'll, I'll express myself one way and then five minutes later we'll turn off the camera and they're like, okay, now do it this way. Now you're talking to teenagers. Go. <laughs> right. Well, I, you're so passionate about it. It comes across. And, and the thing is, it's authenticity. And I think that's the key word today. You know, as a host myself, having worked with producers who want you to be something you're not, is so difficult because really you know when you're authentic you're in the moment with wildlife that's when your pure passion and drive comes out to be doing what you're doing uh, and um, people can tell you know something it's authentic and something it's not and so it, it comes across so well yeah there is definitely times where i know it doesn't i know it doesn't come off authentic and there's going to be challenges depending on you know your time frame of the people that you're working with um the attention span of the animal if the sun's going down if there's a lot of planes um, 
And so all the stuff people don't see, yeah, right? the, the behind <laughs> the scenes that make life so hard oh. as a as a film crew for a film crew. Yeah, it's yeah. Incredible. There's times where you know I'll have three lines that I need to get across, and we've changed the script 15 times because circumstances have changed. So we'll have to reword it, but then I want to reword it to make sure it sounds something like me. But I'm still like as an actor taking something Stephanie wrote to try to memorize very quickly, and because of um, restrictions, there's times where I'm not allowed to move. And I am very theatrical in the way, and, and I, I, I am very animated and I want to move around, but that's going to mess with the lighting. That's going to mess with the focus. And so there's times where I'm not allowed to move and I feel like a mannequin and then I feel very claustrophobic. And I can tell quickly, and everybody that knows me very well can see that's one of those moments. And that's, you know, it's not everybody's favorite, but sometimes that's, just what we need to do to get the shot and I'm hoping with time that that will evolve and maybe we'll add more movement you'll follow me along on the journey um, but there are still gonna be times where I have to do that and I have to challenge myself to to figure out how to be more authentic in those moments well and it, it's a big production you're not working with um you know, just a camera guy and a producer, and you know, it's all natural lighting. I, I saw with some of your photographs earlier on that you know, the, you're having lights put up or or reflectors or all sorts of stuff, so you're having to stay in a spot to make it, you know, so you're not moving out of the light. And it does, it's stilting, you know, it's um, I've been there and I know how hard it is to then go, Wow, I was really in the moment, I've really had it down, and now I've just lost all of that and I've got to <laughs> pretend. <laughs> oh gosh, there's times where I like. I remember we were, f we were filming cheetahs and I just, I did my cheetah bit. Like I love this bit that I had and I did it and it was probably like three to six minutes long and it was, I felt fantastic about it. And then we got done, they're like, okay. And they waited for the plane to go by. And then I finally heard the plane and I was like, crap, there was a plane. And they're like, yeah, that whole last like 40 seconds, there was a plane. And unfortunately you repeated yourself kind of once. And because we're doing th uh, bits that are under three minutes, for online stuff, we don't have time for me to always do long analogies, metaphors, or repeat myself in any way. Um, so I've had to learn how to be very concise with things that I say, which is extremely difficult because it's, it doesn't feel as conversational. So I know as a lot of hosts, that's very challenging because there's times where you want to just, I just want to converse with you about this cheat and be like, yeah, you know, and never mind. I'm going to interrupt what I'm saying there because this is actually what's cool. And you know, it's kind of like, you know, the leather on a football and da da da. And That's why podcasts are good, right? Because yeah. then you can just do it. <laughs> yeah, and like right now, just I just what the, what the hell was that that I just fazzed out about? <laughs> um, but that's that I feel very constricted with, and it is it, it's very challenging um, that for sure. So tell us about some of the experiences you've had on the show. I mean, you know, you've been doing it five years now. You must it's have had my fifth year. Fifth year, yes. and, and even before that, you were doing incredible stuff. Anyway, um, tell us about some of the highlights that you've had working on the show? Oh, there are so many. You know, I could sit here and tell you all day long how amazing it is to dive with sharks and crocodiles and how excited I am to see a polar bear up close when I go up to Churchill here in a couple weeks. But to be honest with you, being able to observe that animal and almost like telepathically figure out what their story is and, and translate it to other people and then see how passionate those people are and and then work with the scientists that we involve in our filming as they share their passion and what they observe and what they feel and then us coming together this like-minded experience to be like okay what can we do to help out this polar bear and share its story or to get people to vote a certain way or um you know get people to donate or donate their time or share something on facebook you know that to me is will trump everything I do. Every single film or every single shoot that we do, it, there's an individual or a couple individuals that we work with and I'm just like, yes, you get it. You get it. And look at what you're doing. Like every day you're so passionate about, you know, condors and you're going the extra mile to, f to save these condors by trying to reach the ranchers to say, we're not, we're not going to tell you to stop shooting animals. It's your property. You have all the rights if it's not an endangered species. However, would you consider switching from lead ammunition to another option that maybe won't poison the individual and poison animals that are scavengers that eat that individual? Um, and 
and to see how passionate they get about that stuff and that they're they're using creative solutions to work together going back to my my passion again about you know the fishermen listening to the ceo and vice versa you know i want the conservationists to listen to each other and work together and i want them to talk to the public the, the fishermen and the ranchers and and and, and separate that that division and say, let's listen to each other, let's work together. And the fact that there are scientists in every single one of our episodes that we film that are doing stuff like that and they're successful with it, with it is what has been life-changing for me and very empowering. Um, so I don't know if that's an answer you're looking for, but really the people, I love animals, don't get me wrong, but I love people. And I love people connecting and seeing that light bulb go off is just addictive. Well, it's great because your passion lies within <clears throat> helping get stories out and issues known um, and helping, uh, you know, the best way you can with a situation. And, and that's your passion and, and that's fantastic. And I think that goes right back to the stuff you're saying when you were traveling and how you were doing that in your own time anyway. And, and I think that brings us full circle to, um, I, I love what you were saying about how, you know, you would be in the water tagging a whale shark, but in the morning you might be cleaning the toilets or, you know, doing that. I ran a wildlife park for much of my life and I would have volunteers come along and I found that only about 10% of people who came along were true volunteers. And they were the people who realized that if they wanted to work with the tigers, that they were gonna to have to clean out poop of a donkey for a week or six months or whatever, because they had to show that they were committed to do what we were all doing, right? They, they thought that uh, some of the people coming along would think that a, a volunteer's experience was very much like a visitor's experience, just more up close and personal. You could just do what you want and be closer to the wildlife. What they didn't realize is, no, animals need a lot of uh, care, husbandry, they need to be taken care of, and someone has to do the dirty work. And so we would <clears throat> weed out so many people who weren't willing to do that. I would always give that advice to people. You know, if you want to get into working with wildlife or doing any of these things, you've got to be prepared to put yourself out. And one of the best ways is to volunteer, yep. right? Put yourself out there, show that you're willing. Um, you've done a lot of that. Yeah. On, on top of that, I mean, I'm sure that would be one of your, your things that you would tell oh, people. Oh, that's the number one. That's the number Hands one. Hands down, number one. What else would you say to someone who is looking specifically to become a host? There's a lot of people. What, oh, yeah. what would you say? What would your advice be? I could be? probably write a whole book about it. <laughs> it's, it's, there's so many different things you could do. I think for me, it's, it's, uh, I get frustrated when people say, I want to work with wildlife and conservation or I want to be a host. How do I be like you? You know, Tell me your story so I can follow your path. And I'm like, dude, we, we are going to have totally different paths. I, I didn't know that this path was going to happen. However, all um, I have a women in science and exploration project I'm doing right now where I'm combining the stories of over 50 women right now of all ages and ethnicities and in many areas and what we all have in common now that I got them all on my site and I've read through all of them is that basically number one be willing to, to work for free if you love it you know you should already if you or you want to do something you love and you're passionate about every single day that you wake up to and you're so excited you would do it for free i would do this hosting job for free mutual to, to don't take that seriously but yeah, i would <laughs> but um you know it's you would be willing to do it like if, if money wasn't an issue what would you do and um it takes team effort so volunteering is extremely important and i think it's also very grounding to know all the different roles that are being played and that you're not going to be able to do tiger conservation paw print work unless you know how to clean a tiger poop and make sure that um, you know, they're, they're cared for in the first place before you do p paw prints. So volunteering is extremely important. My second advice would be if you want to host, um, you're going to need to get in front of a camera. You're going to need to practice writing scripts or um, right, making bullet points or having just creating what your voice is and what you want to say and that's not going to happen overnight. I struggle with it all the time. I still actually haven't created a YouTube channel. I still haven't put myself out there a lot because I'm still trying to figure out what my voice is in this very animal welfare sensitive world right now. I want to help people understand everything but it's scary to find that voice. Well, we need to, you know, and, and I have done it enough to obviously get to where I am. However, I, I would recommend get in front of a camera, practice, throw your stuff up on YouTube, create your own YouTube channel. The only problems you're going to have is if you don't own a camera, but it doesn't matter. You can do your phone. I've seen people make documentaries with their phones or their GoPros. 
Um, and then editing, you can use simple iMovie. Teach yourself, okay? It stinks. It's a hard process, but how bad do you want it? You know, are you willing to learn video editing is scary? Or you then do it. If you're if you want to work with tires, you're gonna have to scoop up poop. I call all of that scoop and poop. <laughs> you, Which it is, right? You know, it's the, exactly the things you don't want to do that are hard and scary, and maybe you don't have the skill set for. You're gonna have to scoop the poop to get to those places. So first would be volunteering everywhere you can in any position that you can get in, even if it's grunt work. Secondly would be getting your face on camera and practice and find somebody that can help you with some of the scooping of the poop too if you if you really want it. And um, the third would be, you know, get it, creating your brand and getting yourself on a website and social media and just putting yourself out there. Well, and that leads to social media, something you guys were speaking about on your panel this morning. It seems that um, social media really now is becoming a, a force to um, be reckoned with when it comes to TV. You know, all, all the TV networks are moving into the social media uh, arena because they know that's where they're, they're going to meet their audience. Uh, new audiences are all online and um, we've all got to adapt to that. What kind of things are you doing? Um, you said that you haven't got a YouTube channel and you know, personally you're not doing mm. stuff, but for your hosting work, what kind of things are being done for social media? Okay, well with uh, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, we have a platform everywhere. We're doing Pinterest, Tumblr, Facebook, Snapchat, um, Instagram, and we uh, plan accordingly. A lot of the time we have to strategize it, especially with a shoot, you have a limited amount of time and you know, we tried to do a Facebook Live when we were in Mexico and in the Bahamas, and it just was not going to happen. Our reception was terrible. Um, but we still have plans, and so that's really important to, to have a strategy. So we do have a team of people that are not only collecting the content, but are pushing it out and tagging the appropriate amount of people and engaging. And so I'm, I am heavily involved in that as well, which is really cool. But it is very overwhelming because you're already making a project and then you're doing all of these other social things on the side. But they are marketing pieces, basically. So if, if we take a picture that I showed in the panel or a video this morning of, of me swimming with Caribbean reef sharks, and I'm with Christina Zanato, who's just this incredible shark behaviorist, and I'm seeing something I've never seen before. Her surrounded by 30 sharks, and these sharks have no interest in biting us. They're very intrigued by us, just like we were with them. And every time they went past me, they looked at me. Like, their eyes, like, they were, they were just as curious, like, hey, who are you? Christina, who's this girl you brought? And... It was just so amazing and it came up to the, the boat and they just so happened to have the cameras on and captured me basically in a very emotional moment like wow like I've always studied and I love sharks but that was a perception breaker for me like wow okay I can be surrounded by 30 sharks and they're not going to try to eat me like movies try to tell me and, and what I try to tell other people too and I still had that moment well that was a great clip that was really authentic I believe and so they took that let's say 30 second clip and they put it up on Facebook and it, it hit it did really really well so there's things we can plan and then there's other things you can't plan at all like I was also mentioning um, I was at a nonprofit that does a lot of uh, animal encounters um, with expert trainers with um, river otters and I jumped in the water to to spend time with them and I just did not trust that they weren't going to bite my fingers I was seriously close to, like, my fingers were in a fist the whole time so I'm like they I don't probably would have done <laughs> I mean in the wild obviously we know that otters would bite your fingers off they're just being playful or just feisty or whatever they're bipolar in my opinion but I love them to death and they weren't doing that because of how they were nurtured from babies and they were so fun and they ended up just, I, you don't see it in the clip, but they're far away and then all of a sudden like seven of them all swim and climb on my head at the same time and they're digging in my ears and digging in my mouth, which is a behavior they use to try to find food under the rocks to eat in the riverbeds. And that clip went viral. We couldn't plan that as well. So the social media game is, is a game at that and there are there are 101 things that you can do if you can keep up because algorithms ch are changing constantly. Um, but there's also going to be those times where you just have to be brave and just put on your camera and be like, well, let's see what happens here. And it may go great or it may go <laughs> fall flat on the floor. So it's social media is hard and it's exhausting. Well, and, and the fact that you're already doing something is pretty taxing. I mean, making wildlife shows, they're long days. It's exhausting when you've got to go on camera and you've been out somewhere for a week or two weeks and you're exhausted it can be really really hard on top of it put social media in and you're having to create content specifically for that as well as doing the show it, it's a, that's a lot to do but it is helpful because once we put that clip up of the shark video 
and people see that and they're like, I want to feel that. I want to know what she just experienced because I, I want to learn more about maybe how I'm wrong about sharks. So then we can say in there, hey, if you want to see the rest of the episode, it premieres this fall or this November on the 3rd. And so it ends up becoming like a marketing advertising piece as well. But it, that is what is helpful for it. For well, sure. And you get instant feedback as well, which must be nice showing that, oh, look, people are really engaging with this, which is cool. Where, whereas it used to be that you'd make a show and you wouldn't know if anyone engaged with it for a year. Right. Yeah. So, well, I mean, it, it's fantastic. I think I think what you're doing is great. And I saw some of the clips this morning. It looks awesome. Um, uh, I think we're at a place where we we just don't know where TV is going. It's a changing, we're at a junction. There's all of this new online content, broadcast TV still there. I think, um, you know, what, what you guys are doing with Mutual of Omaha is really kind of meeting in the middle there and um, bringing it to a new audience, which is great. Yeah, we're really excited because this, this year we have filmed at a animal, a carnivore animal sanctuary and in the kelp forest, I just got back from there. We filmed American crocodiles, and now we're going to go up and do polar bears. And we're going to dig a little bit deeper with conservation, which is always a little scary word for some people, too. But what's really cool is the new thing that we're going to try to do to meet our audience, you know, halfway. We're, we're kind of I'm, – I'm a – I don't know if they call it like a zillennial. I'm like a Gen X and a millennial. I'm right in the cusp there. It's a really weird transition where I understand the generations before me. I didn't have a computer until I was a teenager and didn't so have social media until my middle 20s. And But I also work with millennials and, and spend a lot of time with the younger age groups. So I've been studying their behavior a lot. And when I go to Mutual and I'm like, what are the next pr projects that we can do to kind of meet both of these audiences so we can reach both of them? And it's doing a... a, a a then and now theme. So we have 30 years of archives of videos from 1963 into like 1987 and of Marlon and Jim and the whole crew doing all these incredible stories from the past. And what's really neat is we can utilize that footage so we can show people what type of projects they were doing in the past and what were the major conservation issues, you know, and, and what, what type of film did they do? What type of rescue missions did they go on? And what did we learn over the last 50 years from those from those practices that got us to where we are today. So now when I go up and film, pol film polar bears here in a couple weeks, I can access the footage of the three different times that the original crew went up to Churchill to film stories on polar bears. What were they talking about? What were their concerns? What did the ice look? What, were they even talking about climate change at that point? And now we can compare it to what's going on now. And so I actually get to work with the exact scientist in a few weeks that Marlon Perkins filmed with in like the 70s. So that's going to be really cool to pull the heartstrings of the people that grew up with it by showing that footage and showing like, hey, do you remember in the 70s when eagles were an issue? You know, like that we were losing our 60s and 70s. We were losing our eagles. Well, now I'm working with the same scientists now and look at where we are because of con conservation efforts. So there'll be a blend of uh, good outcomes and bad outcomes. But in the end, you'll still see this this fiercely optimistic person and, and, and footage and, and storyline that will hopefully make you feel hopeful. Well, it's awareness, right? That having that ability to go back and show that good or bad. I mean, the bad stuff is, you know, it's got to it's got to be there to show that, um, you know, we have to take note and create that awareness. Um, mm -hmm. what, what a great what a great tool. Yeah, well, I'm excited because a lot of there's still people are like, no, there's no way that the you know glaciers melted this much. It's like, well, I have footage to show you the. I will stand in the same place that Marlene Perkins stood in 1977 to show you this glacier, and we're going to talk about. How how much of it is do we think is man-made and how much is just natural cycles that happen on planet earth regardless of human beings being here but regardless of what we say it's happening and we have proof of it so why are we arguing about either side at this point we need to just accept it's happening and as human as homo sapiens we need to figure out how to adapt um to this change no matter what so that we are, our society is healthy so i'm hoping to kind of bring up topics like that which Fan is kind of scary sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, but fantastic. And having so many mediums to do that is so important because you're reaching all of these different audiences. I, I think it's great. I mean, well, I thank you. can't wait to see that stuff. Oh, thank so you so much. So where can people, um, if people want to look at um, the social media side okay. um, where, and websites and what have you, do you know off the top of your head where yeah. they can find that stuff? Yeah, so um, you can go to wildkingdom.com 
or stephaniearney.com. My last name is A-R-N-E. So that's where you can get information about those two projects. Um, all of my social media, every single one of them, I'm primarily focusing on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, that's at Stephanie Arnie. That's my full name. You can get that on my website. And then for Wild Kingdom, the, the easiest way to watch all of the footage, even the 30 years of the original series, plus all of mine and all the different types of mediums and uh, formats, you can go to YouTube. So go to YouTube and type in Wild Kingdom TV. And you'll see two channels. One channel has the archives and one channel has all of my stuff. And that's the best way to really watch all the different things. But then while at Wild Kingdom TV on Facebook and Instagram, Wild Kingdom on Twitter. So it's it's all there. There's there's a oh, lot yeah. to look at. What I'll do is I'll put links to everything you just mentioned on our website Great. page for this episode. So if people didn't get all of those, they can just go on. They can link straight to them. Great, Stephanie. Thanks so much again for being on the podcast. It's fantastic to um, to have you here and just hear your story and and your passion. And just how you got there, I think it's going to inspire a lot of people. Well, I, I hope so. I hope that people see that we all have something we're all passionate about and we all want to do something great while we are here. And all I hope is that when people read my stuff or watch my shows, that they want to become passionate and they want to step up and do their part. And whether that's quitting s as much single-use plastics as possible or being more active with the government or your local community, that's a huge thing, is just to help make good choices within the community to help out the planet, wildlife, and yourself because you're in there as well. Then I know that I'm doing everything that I can If once I start seeing that, and that's, that's all I can ask for. Fantastic. Hey, thanks again. Thank you. If you've enjoyed this episode of the Master Wildlife Filmmaking Podcast, then please leave a rating and a comment. And remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the series. You can find out more information on wildlife filmmaking at masterwildlifefilmmaking.com, where you'll find valuable free resources like downloadable reports and video tutorials. Thanks for listening. <laughs>